We're starting in 10 seconds. <gasps> anyway, Piotr is speaking first. Dzień dobry, witam wszystkich Państwa na spotkaniu Antifa przeciwko wolności, spotkaniu z amerykańskim dziennikarzem Andy No, który poprowadzi Agnieszka Kolek. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome our special guests, uh, Andy No and uh, Agnieszka Kołek. Uh, let me um, start with a brief introduction or introduction of our uh, guests. Uh, Andy No is an American journalist. Uh, he has written articles for many uh, magazines, many newspapers, um, among them uh, for uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Post, National Review. He is also uh, the editor at large uh, of The Post. Millennial. Uh, this year he published a book entitled Unmasked uh, Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. You can see it, uh, the book here. Um, and the book soon became a bestseller in the United States. Uh, today he will talk uh, about his experiences with Antifa and other uh, types of uh, street activism. Uh, Agnieszka Kolek is an artist, a curator, a co-founder of Passion for Freedom. Uh, Passion for Freedom, uh, which is a unique uh, art festival focusing on freedom of uh, speech and freedom of artistic expression. She is also an author, an artist, uh, presenting her works, uh, her works um, on the ex at the exhibition Political Art. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us, for accepting our invitation. Um, I welcome you again, and I, Agnieszka, I give you a floor. Thank you. Um, before we start, I wanted to um, warmly invite everyone, also people that are watching live streaming on Facebook, to come to see the show, the political art show here in the, in the castle. Um, I think it's very important to, to see the works and to appreciate them and appreciate the artists for what they, um, the risks they've been taking in their lives um, to just observe the reality around them. And um, I would like to remember Lars Wilks, a, a friend of mine, an artist and an art historian that died in a tragic car crash on a Sunday. Um, in Warsaw, in a free country, you can see the biggest collection of his works now, and you have a chance to go and see this work until the 16th of January 2022. I urge you to come to Warsaw and see these wor works. Wherever you are in the world, get a ticket, get on the flight, and come and see the works. Now, I'm, I'm honored to have Andy here as my guest. Um, we thought that we're going to have a conversation. He prepared the PowerPoint with uh, also interactive media to present um, what he's observed in his um, reporting, in his work uh, reporting on the um, actions of Antifa and in general far left movements in America. Um, I thought the best to start would be for Andy to just do a brief introduction and then we're going to work together with this presentation. I will be asking him questions and we move uh, smoothly through that. And then um, I think we would open the floor to the questions uh, from the audience and I'm not sure, maybe also on the Facebook we might have some questions coming up so we make sure that there is time allocated to that as well. So Andy, if you please start. Uh, well, first, thank you so much to um, this museum for uh, inviting me. It is purely an honor to be able, for the first time, um, to present in the context of um, being in solidarity with artists whose works have been either faced censorship or calls for censorship. Um, and this is my first time speaking in, in Europe, and it's my honor to do it in Poland. Um, I think 
what ties me into fitting in the context of the political art exhibit that's happening right now is that um, there's an attack on the freedom of, of the press in America if you dare to report on subjects or topics that counter what the legacy establishment press wants you to believe, uh, as well as um, politicians and institutions and cultural institutions as well. And what you hear every day in America is that the only threat of extremism that exists comes from the far right. Now, one of the misconceptions uh, about me and my work is that there's this perception out there that I write about Antifa because it's in defense of the far right. It's not true. Um, my parents were political refugees to Vietnam. They escaped the communist regime of Vietnam. They lived through a revolution and regime change and were imprisoned uh, in re-education camps and sentenced to hard labor in the 1970s. And so for me, having an American citizenship is, means much more than the passport that I hold. Um, it carries with it um, a, this need for me to honor the, the history that came before me and those who fought for the freedoms that I and most of my peers really take for granted. So I don't have the luxury of a lot of journalists to dismiss threats to the American Constitution and, and the American Republic. Certainly the threat, the violent threat from the far right exists. That's undeniable. Um, However, that reality is also then exploited to deny the existence of the threat from the far left. And the, when I was a student journalist back in 2016, I didn't know anything about what Antifa was. I was in Portland, Oregon at Portland State University. I worked um, as an editor for the student newspaper. And one of the assignments that I was sent to cover was the protests that were organized after it was announced that Donald Trump had won in November 2016. Now, I live in Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is on the, uh, in the northwest of the United States. It's a very, very left-wing city. I would say it's a political monoculture. And that's important because uh, it, there's no counterpoise and there's no need for moderation when you have dominance from, one so from, from only one political side. So the reaction in my city was not just to protest the election results, it was actually to call for political violence. They took to the streets and started fires, breaking into businesses and properties, and declared that the uh, election was illegitimate and therefore any expression of political violence was tolerated. And what I witnessed on that night as this naive student journalist were mobs of people dressed in black uniforms with their faces covered. This is pre-COVID, so at that time it was unusual. Carrying melee weapons like bats and crowbars and carrying rocks in their backpacks to smash out cars one by one, businesses one by one, and the whole city was overwhelmed for three days. We had three days of rioting because of the election. And for the next five years, what we saw was instead of a realization that we have an, a far left extremism problem, not just in Portland, but in other liberal cities in America, the narrative we were told that was that any reaction in opposition to the Trump administration was legitimate and that people needed to resist by any means necessary. And if, it, if that involves political violence, if it involves looting, if it involves arson, and if needed killing, then it's fine. Um, I wanted to brought, brought this to attention to the audience that you've been attacked, and not only once, but actually twice, and I wasn't aware of the second attack. Um, so the first time you were attacked and you ended up in hospital, and that was really serious. You could have died that time, because um, uh, you had a brain hemorrhage, and, um, and you could have lost your eyesight because it wasn't a milkshake, it was actually some kind of a chemical mixture. So you know the risk of that. So can you, can you tell a little bit more of, about how, 
how the violence manifests itself and, and um, you being aware of the violence, why do you think it's so important that you yourself take that risk to report? Are there no other journalists to report it? Uh, there are very few who do it because if you dare to show up and you don't even have to provide critical commentary. You can just have a camera out to document what's happening. And what's happening is organized violence um, on the streets of American cities. The journalists will get targeted normally with robbery, assault. And if you keep doing it, then keep showing up, as I did. Because, of course, in the beginning, I was harassed. I was threatened. And I refused to back down. I was perhaps foolish, uh, I thought, at that time that this is America, nobody's going to tell me what I can and cannot do in the public space to document public events. Uh, I'm going to do it. And I did so, and then in 2019, they beat me very severely uh, in downtown Portland, stole my camera equipment. Uh, that was the least of my troubles because they bashed me repeatedly on the head uh, and the face and then threw all these liquids on me so I couldn't see. I was hospitalized, I had a brain bleed, so I could have died from that. Um, and that, I mean, that, what happened to me and then the reaction from the mainstream press was, well, Andy's a provocateur, he's a conservative journalist, he's right wing. So like you were asking for it, right? Exactly. Uh, and that's the theme. Um, uh, you see that repeated a lot in a different context in, uh, on this continent, particularly whenever there are uh, jihadist attacks that happen uh, from country to country. The, uh, the liberal apparatus of the press and the chattering classes, uh, instead of focusing on the perpetrators of the violence, then focus either on the individuals or the society mm -hmm. for some type of blame. Mm -hmm. um, so one, one thing that we hear a lot in America, and you see it printed and repeated um, all the way up to the executive level, the, the president, is that uh, Antifa is an idea that doesn't e that it doesn't really exist in an organized form. Um, I've spent now years reporting and looking into the American manifestation of this movement to better understand it. And um, it, the thing with the statement is that Antifa is an ideology. That statement in itself is it's not false. It is an ideology, but I think it's really analogous to the um, radical Islam, for example. Mm -hmm. Radical Islam is not a group. There are many organizations, and there are those who don't even belong to an organization who just follow in the ideology, can be entirely radicalized, either as an individual or as a small cell or in a small network. So you can re think of it more in that way, and that's more along the lines of how Antifa organized in the United States as well as in Western Europe. Can I can I actually ask uh, on that point? Um, so, let's say there's quite a lot of research into radical Islamic groups and how they operate. And people are aware of Al Qaeda. Then when they went a bit down, uh, and there was more of a push within their circles to find everything online and the Inspire magazine. And in a sense, an individual could be could just research things themselves online, or they could be part of a group, and then access manuals how to make a bomb or how to do a stabbing to kill as many people as quickly as possible. So is there also available material online how to riot? What are the techniques? What are the methods to be successful? How to sow the fear? How to target individuals? Can you find materials like this online available, or is it on the dark web? How does you, it work? You can find it easily online at these, they have websites and they call themselves like think tanks. They're, it's not an official think tank, but these are anonymously run websites that have all the um, pamphlets and books available as PDF files that you can print out. And so if you go to these Antifa direct actions, as, as I've done a number of times undercover, you'll see almost always they will have their literature available on a table, like either in the form of a book fair or in a pre-gathering before a riot. And the literature is exactly as you describe it. It has instructions on how to make firebombs, Molotov cocktails, um, how to evade police detection while carrying out 
organize crime, how to occupy spaces like take over buildings and secure exits and en entrances. Uh, very extremist material and, and also, um, of course, how to dox your political opponents as well. Doxing is um, this tactic of uh, finding out, for example, where somebody lives or their phone number or where their family works and releasing that information like on social media and just spreading it out to tens so, of thousands of people. So basically it's like like a open call to action, meaning like open call to threaten you or harm you physically because it's releasing personal data that is very sensitive. And it's not just coincidental. It's not like they are asking to send birthday cards to you, right? Yeah. So, so it's to intim intimidate it's someone to as they see as an opponent, as, a, as an enemy. It's to make somebody live with dread and fear at every minute of the day. And that's what they've tried to do to me. Um, I've spoken about previously uh, about how uh, I had to leave the United States because my information was fully doxxed as well as my family. And mm. people have actually shown up at my family's home on multiple occasions. And um, all of it's reported to law enforcement. A another thing that I'll, I'll get to in the course of this discussion is the the context, the political context in various cities in America that allow this lawlessness to go on, because mm -hmm. it doesn't just spring out of nowhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So maybe, I, I don't know whether you wanted to do a bit of a background in history and then uh, we move on to how the protests are organized, because when I was reading your book, I found it very interesting, the elements of that about the protest. Um, about how to avoid being arrested for carrying guns, so what kind of weapons you use. Then also, what is the role of vandalism in the street protests? So I found it very fascinating, you know, so maybe we can move on. Yeah, so just with, real quickly, with this first slide, um, all these photos on the right are various people who have been arrested at Antifa riots in Portland, Oregon, uh, where I live. Um, the per the public can still request uh, through law enforcement the names, photographs, and charges of people who are arrested. And this is actually um, one of my big projects that I worked along with for this book because this is one of the very few ways for us to actually see who these people are unmasked. Because normally, um, even if they're arrested and charged, their cases get dropped um, at a later point. So there's never a conviction. We have uh, the prosecutor. Um, uh, most prosecutors in the United States are elected politicians. So uh, if you have a city that is entirely left wing, you're going to have a prosecutor who's not going to apply the law evenly. Um, so if you go to any Antifa direct action on this continent or in North America, you'll see that they will have a certain number of, of symbols in the form of flags or banners. Um, and one of that, uh, that those symbols, usually the red flag, the black flag, the two two flags together, all of that comes from um, they're borrowing from a history that happened before that, and so uh, Antifa would have you believe that it's just short for anti-fascist, and that um, anybody who is anti-fascist is Antifa, and they do that intentionally to deceive and to cover their tracks, like. The group that they take inspiration from is the um, Antifascistische Aktion, which was a paramilitary of the German Communist Party just before the Second World War. So the original Antifa were doing a lot of the things that the contemporary Antifa are doing in that engaging in violence and brawls in the streets. Um, the communists in Germany before the Second World War were involved in its, a number of uprisings. Um, to try to destabilize the Weimar Republic. They had a big role in polarizing the public. And this is a history that the Antifa rely on. I guess they rely on the ignorance of this history in the public to sort of fool just the average person into thinking that um, the original Antifa were great groups that are, was a great group that opposed the Nazis. But no, if you actually looked at what the... Um, original Antifa did, what the, the people they were fighting were the Social Democrats, and then we were trying to overthrow the the government of the Weimar Republic. So um, their history is in fighting and opposing um, liberal democracy, which is their agenda today, actually. And um, 
the the morphing of so after the Second World War, um, when East Germany was established, the so-called Antifa ideology was then institutionalized at the state level in of, in communist East Germany. And a lot of people don't know this, but the um, the Berlin Wall, as we think of it in America and in Britain, it was actually called um, uh, the uh, Antifascistische um, Schutz. Uh, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I forget the German word, but it translates to um, anti-fascist defense barrier. So the anti so-called Antifa ideology, when they say that they're opposing fascism, it can include actual fascism, but it can also include liberal democracy and actually anybody that dares to oppose their ideology. So, you know, they would refer, a a ga refer to a gathering like this, the speech itself as a fascist event. Um, and the next video um, that I'm going to play is of what happened three weeks ago in Leipzig, Germany. Um, Leipzig is not too far from here. And you, can you can see viscerally what one of their direct action looks like uh, today. <laughs> So what happened in Leipzig three weeks ago, um, thousands of Antifa from all over Germany descended on the city in the east to hold their protest march that inevitably always leads to violence. So they were destroying property, creating barriers in the street for an autonomous zone, and started fires. And they gathered to intentionally intimidate the prosecutors and investigators who are, is um, pro prosecuting one of their comrades who's accused of orchestrating a violent attack on some victims. So what happened there, um, that, that is what Antifa aspired to all around the world. The German Antifa are, are, the, are the original Antifa and the most extreme and violent. So the Antifa in Portland take inspiration from that. And last year, in the context of um, uh, after George Floyd died in May, um, there were riots that occurred uh, from city to city across the US that really convulsed the country. And um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but we had more than two dozen people die as a result of these riots. Um, in, in my city, in Portland, Oregon, is where the riots lasted the, long, the longest, and being there, on the ground, it was really surreal because night after night after night, you saw scenes like that of people taking to the streets, occupying the, a large part of downtown, um, trying to burn down the federal courthouse, and doing it all in the name of so-called anti-fascism and anti-racism, and having the support of the local press, the national press, as well as the Dem Democrats in elected office. That was. Uh, really surreal. On that note, what came to my mind is that um, reading your book, that quite one one thing is that there is the ideology that it's well hidden from the main view of the public. But then they, whatever is in the public sphere, that could really um, raise the temperature, and and the public can get very emotional about. They use that as a means to. For their own um, for their own agenda, so leaving aside whether there is institution institutionalized racism or not in America, because that's a separate conversation. They use this very difficult situation, and then orchestrate it towards their own goals. And later on, as you will show your um, presentation, there are some videos that they showed exactly how it looks and how it's been shown in the mainstream me media. It was usually said like, oh, they are mostly peaceful protests and so on. But actually what you see is extreme violence, well prepared, well organized. Um, so I find it v quite interesting that they would wait for this moment and depending on the society where they are embedded, they would choose the subject that is the most um, inflammatory, and they try to s to bring the flames higher, 
and then they try to travel on these flames to achieve their goals. So that's interesting. And also the tactic that they, they assess the situation in a country, how far they can go with vandalism, whether this is the point to start burning things or whether this is just the point to do the graffiti just to deface the buildings. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's, it's not just out of nowhere that you, you have seen, this, was, this photograph was taken in Portland on the, uh, shortly before I was beaten um, in the summer of 2019. It's not just out of nowhere that something like this can spring up and you have months and months of organized um, nightly street violence. Um, Antifa's ideology, it's this fusion of anarchism and communism. They, they believe that the communism that was done in the 20th century was wrong because it was instituted from the top down. They believe that it can actually be instituted um, from the bottom, essentially getting rid of states and borders and creating, organizing communities by in communes. That's the ideology. Um, there's a lot of theory behind it. It's obviously not really appealing to the masses. And so how they've been able to really successfully mainstream themselves um, is to exploit certain political events that happen. So in the United States, the election of Donald Trump was used as the pretext that America had voted in a fascist, and therefore now it was up to everybody to oppose by any way possible this new regime. And what was really unfortunate is that they had support from the establishment press, news media, um, repeating these lies and narratives and really poisoning the minds of the public and radicalizing the public, making the, the mainstream left much more tolerant of ext extremists among their midst in these protests. That's how these protests, which start off peaceful, many of these left-wing demonstrations, and then you have a, a, a faction inside that is ready for violence, just take over. And it just happens over and over, and the mainstream left are afraid of criticizing this, the extremists on their side. Um, I, one of the, um, often when the press and liberal establishment talk about the threat of uh, political extremism in the US, they'll point to the far right because the far right have been involved in a number of documented um, killings. And so there's actual body count number, and then they'll say, well, Antifa haven't killed anybody. I think that when you have, th that's not a really useful metric, I think, in measuring extremism. It's lethality is important, but when you have a movement that is involved in destabilizing the locality, radicalizing the public, and create instilling fear in the population, but not necessarily killing, like that, that's also very important, and these other variables aren't being factored in and analyzed. Um, some of these next photos are a little bit graphic, so just a warning. Um, so on the day that I was beaten um, in 2019, there were seven other people who were victimized, assaulted. Um, I just wanted to show some pictures from there so that the public can really see with their own eyes like what it looks like to bash somebody on the head with a baton or a rock, something like that. Um, that doesn't necessarily kill them, but maims them and causes severe injury. So this is one of the, um, this man's name is John Bloom. He was hit on the head with some type of melee weapon uh, by Antifa um, on the same day I was attacked. Um, this is another individual <laughs> named Adam Kelly who was hit on the head with a baton. The person who th did this was actually caught and convicted. Um, he's remains one of the very, very few who have been convicted uh, successfully for carrying out violent crimes. And, um, it, but like the violence has been escalating for the last five years, particularly in the Pacific Northwest of America. And I had been trying to warn the public and to warn local government that there's an issue here in the city. It's not being addressed, it's actually being denied, and if you bring it up, you are presented as a problem. And then what it led to was we had a, um, sorry, let me just pause real quick. That, that was me um, in 2019 when I was uh, beaten and hospitalized. Um, but 
last year during the course of the the riots that were happening every night, uh, there was a, so a self-identified Antifa member because he had a manifesto, uh, Michael Rhino. Um, he shot dead a Trump supporter in downtown Portland. That's the body of the person who was murdered. And so nobody remembers this victim's name. Um, nobody cares to. The press was really cruel in its coverage of this man's murder. Um, and nobody rallies behind um, you know, uh, standing up for this person who was killed. Um, and just for me, like when I step back uh, of my role as a journalist and just as a human, like when in several years ago when um, there was a woman who was killed in Charlottesville who was supportive of Antifa, like that, her life mattered a lot. Like I'm, it, it's irrelevant to me what her political views are. It doesn't matter if she's far left, left, whatever. She was killed in the context of participating in a political demonstration that was very violent, in the context of a violent demonstration, and she was killed for that, and that was wrong. And it's it's good for Americans to remember her name and um, to remember that she was needlessly killed. And on the flip side, um, it's unfortunate that, like, this victim's um, life was completely irrelevant to the public because he was a Trump supporter. Um, Mm -hmm. um, so talking about the violence I was asking you early on and I just wanted to bring it back about the tactics so I was interested in the types of weapons and also what is the role of vandalism why is it so important to get things going to, to bring the temperature up and is it part of this online kind of manual on things the same as like how to be on the social media, how to keep your identity hidden. Because in a sense, you, when you show this video from Leipzig, to me it looks like sort of an army unit. You know, there is a uniform, there is a way how to hide your identity, there is a formation. So it's all very specific. Yeah, what's really, it's really baffling to me that people would deny the organized element of the criminality that's happening. Because clearly these, these people will announce their direct out actions weeks beforehand with flyers. Mm -hmm. And they tell their comrades where to go, what weapons to bring, what to wear, where to meet, what time, and what time they're going on their um, starting their direct action. And yet, we're told over and over that it's uh, that there's no organized element to this. So like, for example, that's used uh, as a kind of an argument not to ban them as a domestic terror organization, right? And within that, then, I'm interested also in the role of the social media and, and all these online chat rooms and so on, because what I find fascinating is if there is a terror attack, Islamic terror attack, then um, the police goes through all the uh, social media accounts, through chat rooms through, you know, they get all the kind of transcripts of things, whatever, it's not encrypted and hidden. And here that's not happening? The, the law enforcement doesn't ask for it? Or is it within this um, political elites, um, in, it's in the interest that things are not really researched and these people are not pursued by law and put behind the bars? So even though law enforcement is supposed to be um, separate, from politics, um, they're still deeply influenced by uh, the political currents. So right now, doing any investigations into ideologies of far-left extremists is, is not considered okay. Like, you'll get reprimanded from your superiors or even maybe all the way up to Joe Biden and those at the executive level of the administration will chastise and potentially even fire various individuals. So you have everything to lose um, if you're, let's say, in the FBI or whatever, if you are to investigate the um, networks that these individuals belong to. Instead, what will happen is the individuals would just be prosecuted strictly on um, the crime they did, uh, which is what should happen. But then in, if you look at the court documents, then you don't see any mention of them their statements about being involved with, um, with Antifa and other symbols that they'll post on their social media, other things that sort of contextualize mm -hmm. why the violence happened. Um, 
you talked about like the, the role of vandalism. Um, so this was this is an iconic um, statue in Portland. It's it was set on fire many many times last year, and the uh, plinth that the statue uh, stood on was hacked away by the rioters who used those rocks and to throw it at the federal courthouse to try to break inside and to throw it at police. So the statue uh, was at risk of falling over, so the city removed it. Um, by my last count, um, in my city alone in Portland, we had eight, eight statues that were either toppled or removed. Mm -hmm. And the, the vandalism is really an important strategy of the Antifa because it's, it's to establish their dominance over a particular area. It's like showing the public that we can do this and we can get away with it. We can tag buildings and monuments with our, our symbols and our statements um, and show the public that we are here and we're watching you, essentially. And last year, um, you know, in the context of the riots, when every, essentially every liberal politician was calling for police to be defunded in some way. Like they, they also, law enforcement were extremely demoralized uh, in addition to being defunded. So there's an issue also of police not having the resources to respond to this type of violence. And that's what happened last year um, in Portland and Seattle when the riots were happening night after night after night. Um, next, I'm gonna play a video that some video that I recorded um, undercover um, from July of 2020 when the thousands of Antifa and far left rioters tried to break into a US federal courthouse in downtown Portland. So that, you see those lasers? They had, they were so organized in the violence, they had entire teams, people who threw explosives, lasers to blind the eyes of law enforcement. And more than 100 officers received eye injuries. They came with only electric weapons to try to, not what, excuse me, electric tools to try to cut down this fencing. And I was recording this, That's, that individual came up and asked him to stop. And then all these people around threatened to beat him up. So then he just left and they continued, um, as you will see, trying to break down this barrier. So eventually that, uh, that barrier was breached, it, was, uh, it broke apart. And you can see I went um, the morning after uh, one of these riots, and this is what our, our federal courthouse looked like in Portland, Oregon. And Portland's a major city in America. Um, the glass was broken, things um, boarded up, and this is what that quarter of downtown looked like for months. Um, and, um, so these are four photographs of four of the eight statues that were um, toppled in Portland. Uh, the top left is Abraham Lincoln. Um, uh, top right is President Roosevelt. Uh, the bottom right is George Washington. So Antifa, just with their impunity, were just attacking every symbol of the city's history. And it's, it's part of their ideology, it's not just vandalism for the sake of vandalism. I mean, that's part of it. A lot of them get caught up in the lawlessness and you know, being allowed to do anything and everything. But doing acts like this is meant to try to erase history, literally, because they don't view the United States as a legitimate country. They don't view any country as legitimate, but the US in particular, they call the US a fascist state. They view it as like the head of a snake that spreads fascism around the world. And so th that, that was why I picked the subtitle for um, my book, um, Inside Antifa's um, Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy, because they don't recognize uh, liberal democracies at all. And 
this is their, their double speak when, when they say that they're against fascism, what they're referring to are uh, free societies, actually. And like this lawlessness just went on and on and on last year, and it devolved to a point where in Seattle, which is the largest city in the Pacific Northwest, they actually established an autonomous zone. I went there, and it was... I didn't feel like I was like this could happen in America. It felt really like they actually took over six blocks of city property and had checkpoints, multiple layers of checkpoints. And so you see the barriers here. And it looks like, you know, these are people just standing around. But if you go there, you, they have guns out. And they ask you, who are you? And this was in America. And it was allowed to go on for three weeks in a major American city. There was a police station in the middle of that. The police had to evacuate. And in that area, there were thousands of people who lived there, high-rise apartment towers, businesses. You couldn't drive in. You had to ask them permission in order to drive in or out. And this entire project was celebrated in the press by the local politicians. That was what was so unbelievable. Uh, the mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin, she went on CNN. She said, this could become a summer of love. Um, the local press were saying, oh, th this is... Um, this is not a, um, these aren't domestic terrorists. These are people who are providing for the community. So when people say that, you know, what's so bad about anti funny ways? I say, look to Chaz to see what happens when they're given the space to actually do state building. What this devolved into were six shootings and two people were murdered in this autonomous zone. And there was an attempted rape, there was arson. I was there at night and you could hear screams because it was such a large area. They had people in tents. There was all this violence and law literal lawlessness happen happening. When the shootings happened, the victims had to be brought out of the borders because police couldn't go inside. That's mm -hmm. how crazy it was. Uh, uh, before we go any further, I was also thinking about, as you were sh sh showing the mag shots at the beginning of, of, of your presentation, um, how do people meet and get involved? Reading your book, it reminded me of Scott Atran's book about looking from anthropological point of view at how certain jihadist cells get organized. And there was a strong element of sports club, like a soccer club, or also maybe they met at university and they were in a student society. Is there an element like this? And also, what is the role of the intellectuals in the movement? Because what struck me also in your book was, was this tactic of using lawfare. Where, where you have um, lawyers that they would work pro bono and they would try to destroy the system from this kind of um, side where you lodge so many complaints, so many legal matters that you clog up the system, but also you drain the finances that could be otherwise directed towards something else. So it's another tactic how to destroy the system democratic system and the institutions that work for all of us, no matter what point of view we have on politics. So can you talk about that? Like, How do they kind of meet before they become part of this non-organized, organized protests? And then also, what is the role of the intellectuals in that? So one way that they sort of plant the initial seeds of radicalism in the minds of new recruits is through holding these um, book fairs where they have their tables with the literature. And this is not illegal. It's not illegal to have uh, an anarchist communist uh, book fair or anything like that. But if you pick up these texts, then you see how extreme they are. And the role of the intellectuals is that the, um, the ideas in it, these are like um, ideas from, from Marx, obviously, and from various other anarchist intellectuals. But they distill it in a way that's you can read in a four-page pamphlet. And from there, they do other... They have social events as well. Um, they're so inspired by the, the European model of how Antifa, particularly the German organizing of Antifa's um, around the sports of, of soccer. So um, soccer is not particularly popular in the U.S., but in, in Portland and Seattle, there are official teams. And what has happened is the Antifa supporters have infiltrated and taken over the uh, the football um, fan clubs. And when you go to these games, as I've, as I've done, you see the Antifa symbols and flags are being waved around. And all of this, what it does is it helps, it normalizes their symbols and their messages. 
to the point where the population don't even view it as extreme anymore. Like, you know, if you see the the three arrows writ, um, graffiti, you don't step back and you know view it in the same way as you would like a swastika or if they do a um, a, um, a hammer and sickle symbol. Again, it's just kind of normalized now. That's the role of that. And then and then to address the point um, about lawfare, very important. So. The video I just played and every and what you saw before, that type of sustained organized violence takes resources, and so a lot of people were getting arrested as we saw as I uh, in the first slide with the mug shots. And what would happen is um, these antifa would establish these um, ad hoc groups that would fundraise money for bail. And they raised so much money. So just in Portland alone, one of the groups raised 1.3 million US dollars. So you can have people who are arrested on assault, arson, other really serious violent crimes and get bailed out instantly. Bailed out. And then because the prosecutor is biased and in my view corrupt, um, the charges later get dropped. The money that was paid for the bail is returned because the case is dropped. So then they have that money back to pay for other bails, pay for riot gear, pay for transportation, pay for food. It's unbelievable the level of organization. And then there are very f extremist left-wing um, attorneys who file all these lawsuits against the city and the police department. So what happened early on in the riots is that police were, um, were using tear gas um, to disperse the rioters, and it was very, very effective. Um, and then all these lawsuits came in against the city, ag against the police department, saying that the the use of tear gas was too indiscriminate, that it was uh, affecting people who lived nearby. So then a judge would place would place an injunction and prevent the police from um, using tear gas. Uh, another one was um, when the rioters were trying to burn down the federal courthouse. Because that's federal property, federal law enforcement had to protect it. But in the streets in front of the court, that's part of the city. And normally, that's supposed to be policed by the local police. But the mayor, being left wing and trying to please the constituents, issued a decree prohibiting local law enforcement from cooperating with the federal government. So that's these are like all the things that have to fall into place for you for that to happen what we we just saw. Mm. So it's been coming coming and going through our conversation the fact that everything started to um, get more violent and and more um, prominent since the election of Trump. Now we have a new president um, Biden and has anything changed because my observation, and I might be wrong, you can correct me, is that it looks a little bit that to the Democrat uh, Party, it was a bit, they were a bit useful to create this impression that the whole world is getting out of control and it's all on the, at the hands of Trump and his bad um, style of governing. And once we get back in power, things will get back to normal and calm and civilized. And is that the case? Has the violence stopped? Has things come down? Or is it still going on, but just a different pattern? And what do the elected politicians now sitting in power, so they cannot blame anyone else for what's going on, how they respond to what's happening? Uh, the consequences of the political decisions that were made last year will be long felt. And it doesn't matter who is in the executive office. So Biden campaign on uh, bringing America back to normal, America's back. But this, the spike in violence across, you know, across the United States and homicides has spiked um, in terms of the percentage increase, like some of the highest percentage, percentage increase in homicides on record in America. In Portland last year, um, after after George Floyd died, in in the midst of all the riots, the local politicians abolished uh, the gun violence redu reduction team of the police because they said police are racist, and so they took away this unit within law enforcement that actually addresses gun violence in the city. And now we have a record number of shootings and homicides in the cities. 
and this will be long felt, these political decisions that were made last year. So it hasn't gotten better under the new administration. And in fact, even though the, num the frequency of the riots has declined, um, and it goes back to what you said earlier, that there has to be some type of event to be exploited by mm -hmm. Antifa on the far left to get the people on the street. Because otherwise, their actual numbers are relatively small, and by themselves, they're not, they aren't that effective. They have to really embed themselves in a larger gathering of leftist protesters. But what has been happening is that the, the use of force has escalated in, in the times that they have held direct actions. So on the 22nd of August, Antifa took over a waterfront in downtown Portland and created an autonomous zone for the day. They were very much like a paramilitary in that they actually had people going on patrols with military gear and rifles in front of them. Police just stayed away and let it happen. In the, in this was in downtown during the day. And then later on in the day, they confronted a 65-year-old man they accused of being far right. It was a random citizen walking in the street. There was a shootout, and one of the Antifa shot at him. Fortunately, nobody was injured in the shootout. The man surrendered himself. He was arrested and charged. The Antifa w escaped, still at large today. Um, then two weeks after that, in a nearby city in Olympia, Washington, um, Antifa engaged in another shooting and actually shot somebody. Um, and that person was recently apprehended. So this is a, like the, it, it's, it's, so this is what I mean when I say like it's getting worse in a different way. Mm -hmm. It's not the same nightly violence that we're seeing as before, but the tool, the weapons that they're bringing out and are willing to use now are weapons that will kill. Mm -hmm. You you had some documents you showed me because there's like this pattern. So I, I heard and read that quite often when the politicians are being asked to designate them as a um, domestic terror organization, then, oh, there's not enough evidence and and um, it cannot be proven and so on. So would you would you be able to, to show them and, and to explain, especially with, you know, when you have the evidence online, then obviously it's wiped out and, and we see the papers from the court and can you can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, so, so these two headlines is really emblematic of what the legacy press in America says about Antifa, which is again and again to repeat this mantra that there's really no evidence for Antifa. And the thing is, if you look at a court document and it says this person is accused of, let's say, felony arson or felony assault and felony rioting, it doesn't say anything about what they believe, what networks they're a part of. You would have no idea. And the press then says, see, no evidence of Antifa. Well, I mean, this is then my role where I step in as a journalist and what other journalists should do is you should then look in who the suspects actually are. So that's one of the charging documents. So you see this, this suspect, Ryan Howe, these lists out the charges to incite a riot, to organize, promote, encourage, participate in a riot. It doesn't say anything about Antifa, and it wouldn't. But then I go and I look at the social media, which nobody bothers to look at. Oh, well, look at that. So, and I have so many examples of this. So it, it drives me, it does my nut in that um, to hear over and over, there's no evidence for it. I'm like, the evidence is there, you're just not looking. And then, of course, very quickly after these people are arrested, they'll delete anything that exists online. But, you know, that's, I, I try to save whatever I can find. Um, this was in Portland, this was at the start of the rioting. This, this criminal complaint here was probably one of the most illuminating. So this individual, um, um, Amelia Shamrovitz, um, she, she was reported to police by her housemate because, and according to the criminal complaint, her housemate said that she came home and told her that she participated in the riot, in arson attack, that she's part of Antifa and that she was looking forward to go out to going out again so that she could hopefully kill police. This wasn't reported at all in the local press or the national press. Like nobody bothered to quote from the, this is actual court document. And of course, this person was charged with a number of crimes and the case was dropped. And that just happens over and over. We had, 
a th more than 1,000 people in my city alone, Portland, that were arrested at the riots last year, 90% of the cases just dropped by the prosecutor. And the number will probably be higher in the end. Um, this isn't, uh, one of the things that people don't talk about a lot is that Antifa don't just attack like law enforcement and businesses and statues. They also go after um, symbols of Christianity. Uh, it, Antifa is an atheistic movement, but they hate Christianity in particular because they view... They, they don't attack, attack mosques? No. They are afraid of confrontation? Exactly. <laughs> they, they are pussies. <laughs> So this was in Portland. This was at one of the Antifa riots. This individual uh, was actually um, caught. Um, she uh, was van had, as you will see, um, smashed up a Catholic church that provides charity uh, and outreach for homeless people. So this is what they do. You know, they march on the streets, and you just see the tactics. They're all dressed the same. Very quickly, destroy a particular building and then blend, run back into the crowd and blend right in. Um, and street preachers have been assaulted by Antifa in multiple cities. Um, Antifa will write, um, this is really disturbing. In the summer, there was a, um, a open prayer event for Protestant Christians in Portland, which is quite unusual. Portland is not a religious city at all, but there was a small gathering in the waterfront in downtown, and it was a family event. There were um, mothers and children there, mm. and Antifa called that event a fascist event. No basis for it at, at all, other than that it was a con conservative and traditionalist get gathering. And Antifa came and smashed up the sound equipment, threw it into the river, through explosives at the crowd. And in the video, there's only a few videos because Antifa don't allow people to record, but from the, uh, the Protestant side, some of them had cameras out. And you could hear Antifa say, where's your God now? So I'm not a religious person, but when I hear and see over and over this multifaceted attack on all these sacred things, such as freedom of expression, freedom of religion, art, history, like this is what I mean when I, talk about like the threat that Antifa face, uh, uh, um, the, the threat of Antifa, you know, it's not just bought, like people who are killed. Like you can't just measure the danger of a movement by how many they kill, you know, if, if they are maiming people, if they're setting cities on fire, it's like, these are all things that have to be taken into account that are not. Mm. Oh, the person who smashed up the church, that was, again, so, the local press are reported that this person was arrested and charged for vandalizing the church. Doesn't mention anything about their political views. Again, I looked up, and that's their photograph on the right. So again, just emblematic of, you know, and it's not an accident, too. It's journalists who are intentionally looking the other way. And they would not do the same thing for far-right extremists. You know, with far-right extremists, it's like if somebody has a Nazi tattoo or Nazi symbols in their social media, they report all of that. That's really important into understanding and contextualizing the crimes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Benjamin Varela, I reported him recently. He's one of the most recent arrests, just happened uh, at the beginning of, uh, or actually no, just uh, two weeks ago. So he, in Olympia, Washington, I talked about the shooting that occurred. Uh, this is the suspect in that shooting. And um, I looked at the criminal complaint. After the shooting, um, the shooter went into an alley and had and changed out of the black clothing, threw it away change into normal clothing. Um, the, the suspect was identified a different way. But it just goes to show you how like they, they come with weapons with the intention of carrying out crimes and having a, an exit strategy ready as well. And so we discussed different aspects of it. We, we looked a little bit on the social media. Um, is there anything you would like to add on the social media and um, and how it's being treated there? Whether you know they look into that, whether they they try to moderate it or ban some of the accounts. Also, is it possible that um, 
other state actors could be involved in manipulating this situation because it's very easy to infiltrate different groups and also under disguise or a different name to also kind of create certain situations to to manipulate the political situation in another country. So have you seen any evidence of that? Um, anything in the public sphere in states in relation to social media and their role in extremism and also here in particular um, Antifa and far left? So I myself have, when I went undercover and was listening to some of the conversations that Antifa were having, they discussed about the importance of Twitter being for what they call mutual aid. Mutual aid is, is just an, is what they call support. So they do a lot of their fundraising um, by sharing certain users, sh usernames that are connected to Cash App and Venmo accounts on Twitter. And because all these accounts are anonymous anyway, if any of them, and not very many of them get banned, but if one happens to get banned, all they need to do is open a new anonymous account they are already connected to the same networks. So the new account can just be retweeted, shared by somebody who has a lot of followers, and then that message is then shared again. And um, fa Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, they talk all about you know wanting to clamp down on incitement to violence and political extremism and glorification of violence. But you go on Twitter, you'll see every minute Antifa are, calling for violence and organizing violence. And I, brought, I bring attention to some of these accounts, the accounts that organize the riots every night in Portland, and the accounts are still on, on social media. So that's an issue with big tech. It's no secret that the people who work at these corporations are, are left wing and have a political agenda. And um, uh, I, in, in that regard, I'm not really sure what can be done. Um, but you can see the, a lot of the organizing is actually done out in the open. Um, you can see clearly on their posts what weapons to bring, what to wear, where to meet, mm -hmm. uh, what to do and what not to do. But also, there's also this element which I found very creepy, the cyber swarming. Can you just describe what that is? I found it very creepy. Yeah, so cyber swarming is, this, uh, is a technique of where, let's say one Antifa account that has a lot of followers they will say, meet, meet at this location in the next hour. They give a time. And immediately they get people there. Um, or it can even be quicker than that. It's, sometimes it can be to target like an individual. Like for myself, I just, I'll make it personal. Um, when I was at a, a fitness center um, last year, um, somebody recognized me and posted to to go find me at this at the gym. Fortunately, I was gone before anybody confronted me. But this is an example of what they do, and they can actually get people um, to a particular event to harass um, or potentially assault somebody. Mm. Um, I think maybe it's time to open uh, to the question from the floor. Um, would someone be running with a microphone, or yeah? Because that will help with the recording and the Facebook. While that's starting, and just with this final slide, I just like these are the type of graffiti that they write around Portland. So this is what I mean when I say like it's it's not just graffiti. Like it's it's meant to instill fear in the public in their particular <laughs> subjects. So you know they call for people to kill me all the time and. This is just left up, and you can report it to police. They'll take a report, but nothing's ever done. So that was part of the reason why I left. And um, it's it, it's hard for me to overstate how um, it, it's um, it seems like a contradiction because obviously, when I say a city like Portland is ha allows chaos and anarchy and lawlessness. Somebody from the outside, would be like, what are you talking about? You have a judicial system there, you have a government there, you have uh, a police department, you can go there, you can have a nice time in a restaurant and visit. All that is true, but it's also true that there's also, when political violence is being carried out by the far left, all the pressure is placed on law enforcement to not do anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean when I describe it as sort of lawlessness, that you can have people write these messages and leave it up all over the city. You can have them topple statues 
nobody was ever um, uh, convicted over any of the statutes. So you can destroy property and start fires, um, essentially with impunity. Do you have a recording of some of the threats? Or is it yeah, too, too yeah, much? I can play it. Um, so uh, this is um, just a compilation of some of the phone calls that I received uh, earlier this year, obviously from all uh, accounts who are using fake or unknown phone numbers. You're a fucking little bitch. Do you fucking hear that? You're a fucking little bitch, you piece of shit. You're a fucking little bitch boy. You probably were fucking popular in high school. That's why you're out here fucking around, you fucking dipshit. Guess what? No one fucks with you. You're fucking stupid. Hello, Andy. No, I will fucking find you. I will fucking find you. You're still hiding in Portland if you're not smart enough to get your ass back to the United Kingdom. Andy. Is this Andy? No. Is this actually Andy? Because holy fuck, you're a piece of shit. You are a fucking monster. Yo, you are nothing. You are a fucking fascist who's docks a number of people. Who's... You're a true little boy. It's sad because a grown-ass man will act like this. But it's fine because karma will come your way. And we're not worried about you. Fascist piece of shit. Hope you fucking die. You are a brave man. Thank you for your work, and I open to the questions from the floor. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for arrival to Poland, and I follow uh, your Twitter profile, I think, uh, since uh, 2015, so very beginning. Uh, sometimes I drop my comment. Uh, never mind. Uh, I appreciate. Two, uh, two points. Uh, one is that perhaps for your information, uh, a lot of influence, of course, uh, to American Antifa comes from Germany. And I think you in the United States miss one point, that uh, there is a fine uh, psychological displacement in the uh, German left. In 1968s or around, they made this displacement that they get rid of their fascism from Germany and displace it into onto the United States. Since then, America is a symbol of fascism for left-wing Germans. And uh, most people don't realize how much this is the fact, psychological fact in Germany. Then, coming back to the United States, uh, I don't comment on these obvious things you, you said. One point is that, don't you think that, the, the, let's say, the opposite side, let's say Republican side or liberal side, in classical liberal side, is in fact in disarray? They don't own media or very marginalized ones, so they don't keep any symbolic power anymore. Uh, they cannot arrange foundings in a way like uh, the left uh, side is uh, capable of doing. Uh, moreover, uh, the traditional sources uh, of financing uh, are withdrawing. Huh? Let's say the big capital is going to, to, to the democratic sides for a long time. And there is also ideological uh, the deficit. I would say, uh, like uh, Republicans are either paleo-conservatives, which are marginalized anyway because the times have changed and their paleo, um, paleotic uh, point of view is, uh, is not important anymore, simply speaking. It's not much the, the current times. Uh, or is, again, grounded in uh, classical liberal ideas of 19th century, again, not aligned anymore with the, the modern days. So uh, my question is, where is the, the thinking of uh, American conservative liberalism at the moment? Where, where are the institutions of thinking for, for the opposite to the left? So the American left has cultural dominance in all the institutions that are self-replicating. So you can think of um, entertainment, journalism, um, academe, education, um, kindergarten through um, primary school. And so 
they really captured not just the current generation, but like um, the next generation, the next because of their holds on these institutions of power. So the Republicans, uh, in my view, uh, don't really know how to respond. I mean, no matter how they respond, the press is either not going to cover uh, their response or to cover in a way that is uh, dishonest or um, extremely biased. Um, and another thing is, uh, in in my view, um, when it was politically convenient, like last year during all the riots, you would hear, you would see many Republican politicians in America issue statements on Twitter or go give an interview on Fox News and say Antifa uh, is a domestic terrorist organization, and then just leave it at that. You know, a statement like that, even even from the former president when President Trump had stated it. It's kind of meaningless because um, the First Amendment protects uh, all forms of uh, expression. So you can espouse far left or far right views in the United States. That's not illegal. The government can't pro prosecute you for that. So just going and saying they're domestic terrorists, Antifa's domestic terrorists over and over, to me that views more as a... Um, as a rallying cry to get maybe don donations or to get your, your base excited. There's not a solution to what's going on. Um, I mean, y you see through my presentation that there are so many variables at play that have allowed this to grow to the problem we see now that um, there's not a s really any single simple solution that a political party, even at the executive level, the Trump administration couldn't do anything. For example, when the rioters were trying to burn down the federal courthouse, all the federal government could do was send in law enforcement to protect it, but then you could see the violence that was happening on the streets. They, they couldn't do anything because the local officials tolerated that. So uh, it's a really, it's a deep, it's a social ill that we're experiencing, I think, and I, to simplify in one line, I think there has been a mainstreaming of political violence by the mainstream left. That the the video of George Floyd dying last year was so shocking to the to the entire country, but particularly like the left, they really exploited that to say that like we have to do anything and everything, and if if some people want to use violence that that we have to accept it and you saw commentators going on broadcast television and writing in papers and records over and over the defense of looting defense of arson um yeah One, two, three. Okay, it's working. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that I, conf I can confirm what you said about Germany. I live in Berlin. And every year there is more and more violence on, for example, on the 1st of May. It's the communist uh, holiday. So there are parts of the city where it's pointless to go to if you want to be able to leave them on the same day because you won't be able to. You cannot take a train because the, the metro ain't working. Uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, rent a car because the streets are not passable. You cannot pass through the streets with a car. It's barely possible to walk through the city, through parts of the city on that day. And um, what you said about making political violence mainstream. This is very clear in Germany. You have thousands and thousands of people marching through Berlin on the 1st of May, screaming, um, gib dem Bullen, was er braucht, acht Millimeter in den Bauch. Um, give to the cops, uh, to the bastards, what they need, eight millimeters in their stomach. So there are people, uh, calls to violence have become very, very uh, popular, very mainstream in Berlin at least, and within the left in Germany. Um, but the question I'd like to ask you, um, I've just finished your, uh, no, it's the fourth uh, chapter of your book, 
And so Chaz is behind me, and I love Chaz. It was, well, I know it's a tragic story, but there was a comical element to it because um, it was so disorganized. Um, and the lies you could find on mainstream media, people saying that it's the summer of love and that the gardens they, well, the pseudo gardens they planted, uh, that they were, they, they would feed anybody. I don't think that anything ever really, <laughs> all the potatoes died. But what I mean, well, what I wanted to ask is, uh, what do you think will happen should another jazz happen? Because and what I mean by this question is, when Trump was the president, uh, it was convenient for the Democrats to use all the protests that happened as a manifestation of, of, of a fight for freedom. Uh, this was fighting for a better future. This was fighting against uh, Trump, who was basically second Hitler, right, according to them. And then... What's going to happen now if there happens another chance? Because uh, then you cannot say anymore that, well, the Democrats cannot say that, the, the, they, well, parts of the Democratic Party, I, I understand, people like uh, um, Ocasio Cortez are more extreme than others. So they could support them. But would mainstream Democrats support something like a second chance, given that they are in power now? Um, if the second large autonomous zone was to happen somewhere in the U.S. Uh, by far-left groups, I don't think the Democrat Party would tolerate it with a particular caveat, unless there was some viral incident, viral video, that could be exploited for a larger political goal. So last year, all of... I mean, the reason why Chaz happened was, ostensibly, they said, because George Floyd died then again, that was used as a justification for carrying out months and months of open criminality. Um, so it, the, these extreme acts, they always have to latch on to something for a larger legitimacy. So, um, There's not any legitimacy happening at home, but even if there was some type of video, that, in my view, is not legitimate. I think what happened in, um, in Minneapolis in one incident in a country of 360 million people does not give uh, the right for people to go and to, to maim, to burn, to kill with impunity. And, um, you know, like, it's... Uh, this is the issue with the... One of the, I guess you could, I don't know if you say downside, but one of the issues we have to contend with is with social media is that now any video could be presented out, out of context uh, purporting to show something happening and using that to exploit all these sensitivities and sensibilities. And, and right now, I mean, America had been primed for several years now that America was such an ex a, a racist and hateful country. And so... Like people, was, they just suspended all of their critical thinking faculties. You know, ask what are the, you know, what's the context? So what happened? What happened before? What happened after? Who's this victim? Um, I mean, all these things we learn, you know, at a court hearing, but nobody has the patience for that. They want rage, and if you read the literature of anti fun, you look at their propaganda. Their goal is to make people rage, not to make people think. Yes, can I? First of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate this book and say I respect you very much as a journalist, as a brave man. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, read the whole book at this moment, but so maybe the answer is inside. But I'd like to ask you about historical similar similarities. Do you think about this? Do you write about this? Uh, similarities between uh, Antifa and, for example, Sturmabteilung uh, in early uh, 30s in Germany, because uh, the SA could be easily called uh, anti-com or something like this, anti-communistische action. It was the same, the same way of working. You know, it's we are not, uh, we are only against the big 
threat of uh, Bolsheviks in this moment. And here they are talking about fascists, and like that they are not, unless they are not fascists in, 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 in a real sense. That's the first uh, thing. And I'd like to say that reading your book, I've got uh, under my eyelid uh, such a very famous a uh, painter by John Noel Silvestre, as I remember good the name, the Barbarian in ancient Rome toppling the statue of R R Roman Caesar. And I, I think there is something like this. We've got the Barbarian, those uh, faces yeah, from police files. They are not faces, civilized people. They are faces of Barbarian. but. In ancient Rome, this barbarian came up from outside. In this moment, in America, in the center of the world, these barbarian were brought up inside. You born this barbarian, you American, sorry, I said, you born them, you educated this barbarian. You, how could it possible? How did it how, how it happened? That's I, I think that's the crucial crucial thing, that's a crucial question, answer must, must be done. Um, there's a chapter in the book talk, talking about the, the history of uh, the original Antifa paramilitary. So I dive into the role of various paramilitaries um, in the Weimar Republic before the Second World War. I think if you look at the actions of the extremists who were involved in political violence at that time, let's say, you strip away their uniforms. The actions from the Antifa as well as the Nazi paramilitary groups were really the same. Engaging, targeting political opponents, uh, assaulting people, engaging in brawls in the street, intimidating political opponents with the goal of destabilizing and overthrowing the state. So um, in, in that way, I can also kind of apply um, a similar um, lens to look at the Antifa today in that like you strip away the strip away the political ideology let's just look at their actions what they do and it's plainly violent extremism and what what's used as a red herring by the liberal establishment and that includes the press uh, in America is that to say well Antifa is just opposing people on the right or the far right to me, as a lowercase liberal, it, it's irrelevant to me what somebody's political views are. They should never, ever, no one by law should be targeted for violence because of the political views. So it's, th there's this red herring that, for example, when Antifa, if they you know, throw a brick at somebody or smash somebody over the head or the face with a weapon, they say, well, this person was a fascist. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. That really should be irrelevant in a modern liberal democracy. Why should anybody either espousing certain views or having views that are unpopular or extreme or unpalatable, you want to use, these extremists want to use that as a pretext to carry out acts of violence. And as, and as the mainstream society has sort of tolerated and allowed and said, okay, sure, yeah, these people are deplorable. We don't, we don't care if they get assaulted or killed, whatever, they're deplorable people. Well, then the definition of who is a fascist is always expanding by Antifa. It never shrinks. And it was never, it was never narrow in the first place. In, in, in the American context, too, like, you know, we, Americans don't really understand fascism well. You know, we didn't, on American soil, actually see fascism. So they have in their mind kind of more of just this amorphous, uh, enemy. So um, that, hopefully I answered that question. That question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to um, introduce a little bit uh, different approach to this uh, interesting topic uh, and uh, related to the exhibition above us, uh, the exhibition on the political art. Uh, what is your... Um, what is your thought? What are your thoughts on um, the anti-fascist interest in art? Uh, why do they engage, uh, like for this in this case in this exhibition, they um, they sent letters to the 
to the female artist and uh, encourage them to withdraw from the exhibition. But why is an art exhibition interesting for an anti-fascist uh, movement? And um, do you think it's because they want to exploit attention from the art world, or do you think that uh, they consider art world a, as part of a domain and that uh, uh, that other actors uh, should not be allowed to to make exhibitions? Uh, a great question, and, and by the way, for the audience, this is uh, Jan Lundberg. He's uh, the co-curator of the exhibit. So first, thank you for your your role in making this happen. Um, it it goes to show so that like a lot of attention obviously is focused on the violence of Antifa because it's very visceral. But in my book and in a lot of my reporting, I also focus a lot on things that they do that are non-violent but are extremely damaging as well. I think the attacks on freedom of expression and targeting the art exhibit and spreading spurious claims and trying to get artists to withdraw or to boycott and to intimidate uh, participation in the exhibit. I mean, all, all this goes to show that there's, they have so many tactics um, and strategies that they use to attack freedom of expression. It doesn't just come down to hitting somebody or starting a fire. There are so many steps that they can do beforehand. And I think um, we shouldn't just dismiss it as sort of a, you know, um, an annoyance because by challenging the, the heart of the legitimacy of freedom of expression and normalizing opposition to it in the public, what you do is then you delig delegitimize the laws that protect freedom of expression because if the public enough of the public doesn't actually believe that freedom of expression should be protected or is sacred, you're gonna, they're going to elect people who are going to try to change the law. And we're seeing that in some Western countries. May I? Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing up uh, really powerful uh, images of what happened in, in your uh, town. Yes, and Portland is a very specific uh, geography, okay, and I'm quite sure there are other places, other parts of the United States that have a, a, a very different uh, kind of problem from the political point of view. Uh, I think of white supremacists and Idaho, for instance, you know, or there, there were times when the health agents uh, were uh, pretty much uh, doing this kind of terrorism in Los Angeles, okay? So, so there are different times and different locales and Berlin may be another example, and uh, the particular instances that, that you brought uh, still bring the same question to my mind, because I think the point of your book must be, what are the threats to democracy? And the states are the biggest democracy that we have, but at the same time, you show how vulnerable it is, uh, and uh, somebody uh, uh, smart said at some point, all politics is local. And you gave an excellent example what the local politics means for a place like Portland. It's horrible. But my question is, uh, for uh, the, the, the question, uh, the ancient question, cui bono? Who, who is profiting from it? Okay? And as an example of research that was done uh, from the other side of the spectrum, I read a book by Jane Meyer, Dark Money. And that is, uh, that's a very uh, accurate research of the effort by very few very rich people, among them the Koch brothers, Robert Mercer, and many other who were within their circle of friends and acquaintances, uh, to bring the power to media like Fox News and use it to generate Trump. Trump is a product of the effort of big money, which uh, is very well described. So here, my question to you is, who is the dark money behind destroying American democracy? Because this is just a side of it, but the real issue is the danger comes in all edges of democracy. And uh, the French has a very, very nice saying, it has extreme se touche. So the extremes touch, the left and right extreme are the same thing. 
to answer the question about who's benefiting, um, the enemies of America are benefiting. So that can, if you want to analyze that, let's say from uh, state actors, um, in the last five years, some of these extremely divisive, divisive racial justice groups and websites that were operating on Facebook that were talking about Black Lives Matter and propagating some of their lies and narratives. Some of these groups were linked to anonymous individuals in Russia, for example. That's been established in the reporting. Um, in my coverage of Antifa, I haven't uncovered evidence of foreign involvement in the funding. However, the funding is, is entirely opaque because what happens is people donate either through GoFundMe, Cash App, or Venmo, or they donate to um, these uh, so-called nonprofit groups. And you can never find out who these donors are. And a lot of money is raised, like I said, in, in Portland alone, 1.3 million US dollars. In Minneapolis, when some of the worst rioting happened, um, uh, more than 30 million US dollars just raised for the accused rioters and arsonists. And then candidate um, Kamala Harris actually promoted it on her social media. And we have no idea who, who all these individuals are, and if there are state actors involved. You know, that for an individual journalist, that's, I don't think any of us would have the resources to be able to, to penetrate and to really find out. Um, but, I, you know, like seeing how polarizing and co socially destabilizing these extremist groups and ideologies are in the US, like I can only, like, like who benefits are, are, are America's enemies? Because we're, we're at the throats of one another, literally beating one another in the streets, killing one another, trying to get people fired if they're not, you know, if they're not involved in violence, then they're doing these other things about making um, us distrust one another. I mean, things are really bad in the US. You can, I, I think what was so representative of that, for example, was just when, um, candidate Hillary Clinton in 2015 in a speech just so casually dismissed so many citizens in America as deplorable and irredeemable. I mean, really think about that word, irredeemable, deplorable. It's like, so there's like, I mean, well, we, and um, under the current administration, you know, I think in terms of foreign policy, America is not doing very well at all and internally, just domestically, we're, it's it's terrible. So, um, you know, where in terms of the, the world political order, where America recedes, um, China and Russia step in. So, I have one remark to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, as Andy said, many uh, most of the financial sources uh, founding Antifa uh, precisely is opaque. But one thing is not a pack. I mean, uh, this, uh, district attorneys, which are elected in the United States, uh, organize a normal uh, campaign to, to, to conduct uh, to the office. And guess who was the most successful donor to the most radical uh, left-leaning uh, district attorneys in the United States. George Soros. It was Open Society Foundation by George Soros, of course. Yeah, so... Uh, so, so just to contextualize, district... district you don't like this, I know. Let's uh, listen to the guest. It's not a meeting in a pub yet. We can get to the pub later. <laughs> in the evening, but I think now let's um, have questions for the guests, and uh, if there is no more questions, we can draw it to a close and get ready for the tour with Jon Eirik. So, um, any more questions? Uh, just to finish on, on that, that point that was, was brought up, um, to, to explain for, for the European context, a district attorney in the United States is a, is a prosecutor, the, the individual who can choose who to actually 
prosecute and also has the discretion to drop charges. And um, so you can, that's an extremely powerful position and left-wing activists and groups have realized that more recently and I poured a lot of money into the campaigns of really radical prosecutors who have been elected, um, let's say in Chicago, for example, in San Francisco and some other cities. Jin Dobre, I'm Tara Szczepańska from, I'm an independent journalist from the US and I've been covering uh, uh, video journalism in Portland, mm -hmm. in Minneapolis, <clears throat> and also in New York. Andy, thank you so much for being here. I wanted to ask you about how Antifa ideology is permeating into the schools in America. Recently in California, for instance, there was a Antifa teacher that, um, that the school boards, uh, the parents had raised concerns and, and in the school board meetings, parents of, of these children are being deemed as domestic terrorists, but we have Antifa teachers that are able to um, to spread ideology. Can you comment about what's going on in the schools? Yeah, so Project Veritas had um, did a sting on a, a state school teacher in Sacramento, California, and uh, they had undercover cameras and this teacher was talking about, he was giving extra credit to the students to attend direct actions. Um, in the classroom, there was these secret photographs that emerged of the Antifa flag, as well as a poster of Mao. He was a really big admirer of Stalin. And he was talking about how his goal essentially was to radicalize his students to the far left. Um, after the video came out, this teacher was um, uh, suspended um, and is to be fired. Um, but that's only because of the videos that came out. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think it, you know, it's that teacher had been espousing those views for a long time. I mean, he felt comfortable enough to not just say it on video, but actually to broadcast it with um, images and flags in the classroom. I think people really underestimate the importance of mainstreaming and normalizing a certain idea because the more, again, li like the example of Portland, when you see the hammer and sickle graffiti or the, um, the iron symbol and Antifa logos at, at uh, soccer games, people don't really bat an eye. They just view, oh, it's just, uh, it just means uh, support for leftist politics. So again, so some of these teachers are getting by with espousing and having these beliefs because perhaps in the community, um, people don't really recognize it to be an extremist view. That's the problem. I mean, it, it's a problem not just in America, but across really the entire West, the whole, um, the memories of the, um, the excesses of communism in the 20th century have been completely forgotten. And for America, that's really a big tragedy given America's leading role in the Cold War. Um, but young people just aren't aware of it. So they don't, on the flip side, everybody recognizes uh, fascist symbols, white supremacist symbols for the dangers that they are, right? So um, this is, you know, it's not just down to any individual teacher or school, it's, it's a systemic issue in the wider culture of society not understanding um, that the far left exists and that it's dangerous. Good, good afternoon, Mr. No. Uh, a couple of questions. First, uh, considering the pretty obvious huge amount of obfuscation when it comes to uh, informing about the scale of violence in America, uh, in the mainstream American media, uh, by what kind of amount in terms of in broad, broad strokes, would you say the n number of victims is underestimated of those months and months of riots? Because you mentioned a couple of dozen, and I've heard similar numbers thrown around, but that seems just unbelievably small. So what's easy to track is if somebody's dead or alive, right? That's a binary. So the number that I gave a couple is 26 who were killed as a result of the riots. Uh, the number of people who were injured or who were impacted, let's say their business was destroyed or their home was destroyed or they were injured, that stuff is like almost impossible to quantify. It's like so large and nobody has quantified it. So we don't even have the data for that. 
And again, then that leads to this misconception then that the problems, because people aren't reporting their injuries and it's not being tracked, then it means that Antifa aren't out there hurting people or that BLM rioters aren't hurting people. So it's just, it's um, like, it would really be up, like you, I don't even think an individual journalist could really track all of that. You would need like some type of um, like news organization because the level of work, as, as you can imagine, to cross-reference thousands of instances over months of violence, um, that's ex almost impossible, sadly. Okay, uh, now secondly, from what I gather, both from your work and from talking to radicals on the internet, to be perfectly honest, uh, there seems to be two general sorts of people who join um, Antifa specifically. It's kind of true for other kinds of movements like that, but uh, let's just keep it to Antifa. There's the sort of Lenin kind of people, meaning trust fund kids or at least middle class. And then there's career criminals and adjacent. And when, uh, when stuff actually starts happening, it would seem, like in the example of Chaz, which you uh, describe in detail, the career criminals tend to take over, uh, as was the case of the, rap, the black rapper man in Chaz, whose name I can't recall, but that doesn't really matter. And when it comes to this phenomenon, firstly, am I wrong that this is a tendency? Uh, and secondly, if I'm correct, what is the, um, the reaction of the former, the form, former informal leadership of the group. Uh, do they in any way resist? Are they entirely incapable of resisting because of ideological reasons that come down to he's black so we can't do anything about it? Uh, or do they even have, I don't know, in their vast amounts of training material, which I have no patience to go through, to be perfectly honest, sorry, uh, do they have any tips for dealing with those sorts of situations for their, uh, for their uh, officers, essentially, in training? Or is it something they don't know how to deal with yet, at least, in your experience, of course? Thank so, you. so they call for uprisings and revolution. They think that they can create a new, new, new world order, a new utopia. But when they actually do, are given the, the task of managing themselves, they, they can't do it, not even at a small scale as we saw in Chaz. And part of the reason for that is um, explicitly in the ideology, they reject any hierarchy. So they reject the idea of having leaders. So as, as you can imagine, if you are a movement of anybody who can identify in, all you have to do is to show up and, be, and support them in some way, then you have no control over what happens. So very quickly, you know, even if they, let's say, want to establish a commune, as they did in Chaz, like, then you had all these elements that were engaging in violence with one another. That's how the shootouts happened. And they just they couldn't control it. Um, the con you know, it's one thing if that disorder was contained to themselves, but they, people around them are victimized as a result. And um, they never seem to learn from their lessons. They just keep thinking, we'll just keep doing it. And um, we'll make it work somehow. Um, and uh, w one of the reasons why it was really important for me to track all the arrestees in Portland um, is that we, that gave actually a really large data set. There was more than a thousand people. So from there, what what we know is that the major overwhelming majority are white, even though they you know they they try to really say that they're a movement for people of color. It's almost entirely white, um, young. Um, from uh, there were a large number of adolescents who were arrested. We don't know those names because they're minors, but the majority are in their 20s to mid-30s, and then the age groups after that just completely drop off. Um, and in terms of the economic strata, there's this misconception out there that these are um, middle-class um, people who are very privileged. That's certainly represented in some of the evidence I've seen. Like you have people who are academics, professors, PhD students, nurses, attorneys who are arrested at these riots. Um, but then you have a lot of people who act essentially as 
foot soldiers who can e easily be dis um, discarded. So the ones who have a lot of the ones who have been um, actually convicted um, for carrying out some crimes, this, they they kind of form part of that. Like it it doesn't really matter if this person goes to jail for two or six years because you know maybe they were just kind of a, a homeless person sucked into the political violence. So uh, I write about this in the chapter of the book that I have um, actually a lot of sympathy for people who feel so lost in their life that they that they find community in this extremist group and endanger not just themselves but go out to hurt others as well to find meaning like that like you i think one has to take pity on that and so like the ideology in, in that regard i think is really wicked because it, it preys on vulnerable people and you can see in many of the the uh, jail, mug shots the jail photos that these are people who wear on their faces their instability uh, well, thank you so much uh, for coming to Warsaw and uh, presenting your, uh, your research. Um, my question is, uh, is there any politician right now in the United States pushing for, uh, you know, to declare Antifa a terrorist organization? Uh, because clearly there is, I think, now enough evidence that they could be seen as such. Um, so, for example, in Germany, where I'm from originally, the German state is observing Antifa since the 1980s and collecting data uh, on them. And there, there is a very high bar to do that in Germany. Um, an organization has to uh, be, they have to, build, to pose a significant threat to the democratic uh, order, to the constitution. And the second criteria is that there is a realistic chance that they might succeed. So Antifa obviously fulfills both uh, in Germany and if it is similar in Germany than it is in the United States, then clearly there is enough evidence. Um, and you know, it would be possible to exchange maybe with the German government or other governments uh, to collect information to make a case in the US to uh, push for um, declaring them illegal, basically. And I can remember that uh, I think Trump tweeted something, uh, but as unfortunately often the case with him, there was no follow-up to that tweet, or we never really heard about it, or I never did. So is there any um, chance that that might happen in the US? Um, I guess it would be from the Republican side coming uh, from that direction, if, if any. Um, so what, what are the chances uh, in a post-Trump, or you know, assuming it doesn't run again, uh, I mean, in a situation right now to, to push for, for that, in your opinion? Uh, thank you. Uh, I really admire that um, the Office for the Protection of the Constitution in Germany does really good tracking of extremism in the country from both the far left and the far right. They track the number of instances, and I cite that in the book. Um, in America, though, because of the First Amendment, how it's been legally interpreted through the many, many years is that any... The, the U.S. could never have an office for the protection of the U.S. Constitution because for U.S. authorities to investigate individuals because of their ideological beliefs, um, that would be in violation, is interpreted by the law to be in violation of the First Amendment. So this is, um, I mean, you know, around discussions of free speech in America, this is one of the issues that hasn't really been sorted out really well is that now we're dealing with how do you respond then when you have large threatening movements and ideology that do seek to destabilize and overthrow the state, but then you have a law that presents the any investigative authority from actually um, looking into these individuals? You just, you can't. And so, unfortunately, the far left have really exploited that. Um, again, launching lawsuits, lawfare, uh, preventing police departments from collecting evidence. So. You know, some of the reasons why the um, court records don't mention all these Antifa posts from these people is because that, would, that, that could not be cited as evidence in a courtroom because that would be seen as a government persecuting someone for their political belief. I don't know what the solution is for that. I think, you know, from civil society, it would, should really be the role of our various um, think tanks and organizations to be tracking and doing this work and these organizations do exist on tracking the far right, 
none do the work of tracking the far left, unfortunately. Uh, simple question. Uh, thank you first uh, for, for coming to Warsaw. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, uh, if you can uh, answer this question, but maybe uh, you observe this uh, movement since a few years. Uh, you observe this uh, uh, progress, this uh, developing of the violence. Uh, can you say what they're going to, I mean, what, what the strategy they have, what they want to uh, what they uh, think? What do you think? Uh, how would, how they uh, would like to f uh, function in a in a future in a in a, in a politic in a society? I mean, this movement. Can you answer this? I mean, what is the, the strategy of, the, of this movement? Things. Antifa can really only. Is this the last question? By the way, let's wrap yeah, up I after think, this. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Um, so, Antifa can really only exist in opposition to something. It's in the name Antifa. Um, so, for example, if there was, hypothetically, let's say the, th the reason why there's no Antifa in failed states is because there's, you know, in, in, uh, in a place like where they actually don't have a state, then there's no, they don't organize there because they don't have anything to, Oppose like that, and I and obviously the ideology doesn't appeal to people in failed states. So it's, I see it as kind of, um, as a fantasy for them, an activity that gives them a a sense that they're doing something noble, that they are, um, uh, they're you know they think that they are like the um, people who are opposing the histo fascism historically, and they try to write off that for meaning and purpose in their lives. I mean, I'm not particularly, I'm not a religious person or a spiritual person, but I think it's it's young people today who are a-religious, who don't have meaning and purpose in life and have latched on to this political ideology that really is a fantasy. Because when um, when they actually... <laughs> when you know the state gives them the space to do the autonomous zone, they can't do anything. So, um, um, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. I guess what I'm trying to say is, I mean, that sounds like they're not a very serious movement when I say it like that. But the thing is, I've also demonstrated that they they're extremely dangerous because they they believe in potentially killing for their cause. So. I think, um, I don't know how we get to this point, but really to, for them to be um, weakened as a, as a extremist movement is for their, for their ideology to be delegitimized. De and unfortunately, the mainstream left um, have given them the legitimacy for them to appeal to a wider number of people. Um, and uh, until that changes, there's always going to be this either underground organizing or in the open. Mm -hmm. the last question. Last question. Okay. So you stress in your reporting the importance of the sort of politically biased prosecutors and unmotivated, underfunded police force for, for the success of those movements. And so is there a counterexample of a jurisdiction within the US or outside the country that had a well-funded, well-motivated police force and a neutral prosecutor, did they manage to eliminate the problem or is it not that easy? Oh, great question. Thank you for that. So uh, um, I live in the UK now and um, I think Britain, how they've handled their, their issues with Antifa extremism uh, is really effective. So uh, a number of years ago, um, what their law enforcement did was after there was um, violence that an attack that had happened on a on on a train, the suspects were identified and the judges, being neutral, um, gave them a certain number of conditions on their release, such as banning them from uh, congregating together and um, being out uh, after this time and after that time, and that just really and if the suspects were to um, break these conditions of their release, then there were really severe legal consequences. And that was really effective, actually, in 
um, it just pulled the rug out from them under them completely in a very simple way. Um, in in America, we have this issue where um, judges uh, are just releasing s criminal suspects without with no bail and no conditions. That's for example, that's what happened in Portland. So there were some of these like, suspected rioters who would be released one day and within the same day participate in the riot the next night and get arrested again. I think the highest number of arrests for one person that I counted in Portland was eight. Charges dropped every time. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you, you know, the, 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 this, um, the structure is there to address this issue. This is not like an issue that needs warfare or like um, huge new brainstorming. It's just we have um, a, ju a judicial system in uh, individuals in the judicial system in some cities and areas, jurisdictions that, that are compromised. And um, that, again, um, is because of where the society and the politics of the society is. Thank you for coming to Warsaw, and thank you for, for your work and your bravery. And we are very happy to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you.